ghost. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to today's webinar. We are going to learn about direct bookings. And I am so excited to be here today because we have the best experts in the short-term rental industry on the topic of uh, of short-term rentals and in, in general, but specifically on the topic of direct bookings. Uh, I've been in the industry for about 12 years and uh, I'm definitely super pumped to, to, to have these people on the panel here. Uh, we'll kick it off with some uh, quick introductions before we dive into the content. We have a lot uh, to offer uh, today. Uh, so we're going to dive right into it. Uh, my name is Jasper Rivers. You might know me of the podcast, Get Paid for Your Pad or the book. Uh, I'm also the founder, uh, co-founder and uh, head of revenue management for FreeWild, which is our uh, short-term rental brand. And uh, with that said, I'm going to hand it over to the panelists here for a quick introduction. So Mark Simpson, uh, why don't you kick it off? So thank you very much for having me. Uh, Mark Simpson, founder of Boostly. Uh, I am the guy that Airbnb doesn't want you to know about, which I, I kind of like that title. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I've been doing this for many, many years. Uh, published two books called The Book Direct Playbook and The Book Direct Blueprint, which is aimed at helping any host get going in their, in their book direct journey. And uh, yeah, when the idea floated around of, of this roundtable was put together, I was excited to be part of it. And anytime I speak to you, Jasper, I feel like, Liverpool are also playing at the same time, my soccer team. So I just very quickly checked what the score was. It's not good. So I'll keep you informed of that as we uh, as, as, as we as we go throughout the course of this evening. Awesome, man. Appreciate your uh, intro here. Uh, Arthur, you want to go next? Sure, everyone. My name is Arthur Kolker. I am the founder and CEO of StayFi, which is a Wi-Fi and guest marketing company in the short-term rental industry. And we've been operating since 2018, now and over... 20,000 properties around the globe and super excited to chat with Conrad and Mark because they bring, and Jasper, uh, because they bring such diverse insight into the book direct world. Awesome. Conrad? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having us here, Jasper. This is going to be fun, I think. Uh, so Conrad O'Connell, I'm the founder of Build a Bookings. We are a digital marketing agency that started back in 2016. Our focus is specifically working with the best, you know, vacation rental property managers uh, possible on improving their search, social, email marketing. So that's kind of our focus. Sweet. So as you can tell, we have a powerful group here together today. Uh, we'll go for about an hour. If you have any questions, guys, like there's a Q&A button on your Zoom that you can click and uh, uh, feel free to post your questions up uh, as we go through our, our uh, discussion today. And we'll do our best to answer uh, the questions uh, at the end of this session or even as we go through the uh, the presentation and the discussion. So uh, first of all, let's, let's kick it off with uh, the most important question uh, what, why are direct bookings important? Why should we as a short-term rental operator uh, be even be focused on direct bookings, right? Can't we just get our bookings from Airbnb and VRBO and booking.com? Do we really need to go through the trouble of having our own website and dealing with the safety concerns and whatnot? Give us, uh, give us your quick 30-second thoughts on the importance of direct bookings. Why, why should we be focused on that? Mark, why don't you kick it off? Yeah, I think... What's really important for everybody is you've got to be building your business on, on your own land. And there's no better way to do that than, than direct bookings. I think we all know the power of the OTAs and obviously I'm, we want to be making sure that we tap into their full potential of the OTAs. But at the end of the day, you want to make the OTAs work for you and not the other way around. And that is why having a strong direct booking strategy by even thinking about direct bookings is, is going to be super key. Conrad, you want to go yeah, next? I think, yeah, I think, Mark, you say it well. The way that I always have described it is just kind of like, do you want to be in the driver's seat or not? Which I think is a different way to think about it. You know, and I think a lot of people who rely solely on, you know, the channels to get their bookings find themselves having to bend to the will of what maybe an OTA might want them to do with regards to cancellation policy, with regards to payments, with regards to, you know, whatever they might need to do in their business or want to do in their business that they can't do if they have to follow very rigid rules. So I think it depends on what kind of business you want to build. I don't think that it's always makes sense for absolutely everybody to be solely focused on direct bookings. I think it can be just simply a part of your mix, but I think ultimately it's what kind of business you want to build, how much control do you want to have over it? Certainly offering and having your own marketing engine that you can tune up gives you a lot more control. And I think the clients we work with typically find that that gives them, puts them in a much better space long-term. Offer? Yeah, obviously control and flexibility are key, but at the end of the day, I I see uh, companies that are focused on direct bookings end up being 
more profitable and sustainable in the long run, which is obviously the you know one of the reasons why you go into business outside of enjoying hospitality or running short term rentals in general. Uh, and we when we talk with short term rental operators where 20, 30, 40 percent of their bookings are coming from repeat customers coming from loyal guests. Uh, they really have a view of the guest as, you know, with the full lifetime value. Of, it's not just one booking, it's nine, 10 more in the future. Uh, and when they look at their business that way, uh, they definitely have higher occupancy, more profitable, and are spending less on OTA. So definitely at the end of the day, it's going to drive profitability and long-term success for your business. Yeah. Yeah. All good points. I think for us, the most important thing is brand building. Uh, our company, Free Wild, we, when people stay with us and they come for a direct booking channel, or even if they come for an OTA, we want them to think of us as Free Wild, not as an Airbnb, right? So we want people to leave and say, hey, tell their friends, like, we stayed at the Free Wild. Like, you should check it out at freewild.com versus saying, hey, we stayed at this Airbnb, which was really cool, right? So really the brand building, I think, uh, and to Arthur's point, like that building a brand is essentially that means you're building a sustainable uh, company uh, in the, to, in the future. Right. So, uh, definitely hundred percent important, important. If you want to build uh, a sustainable short-term rental company, especially as the OTAs are getting more competitive, it's more and more inventory on the ODAs and it gets harder and harder to, uh, to really crush it and get consistent bookings from the OTAs. Right. Um, all right, let's go into, uh, the, the two topics for today are really, uh, we're going to kick it off with the state of the book direct movement today. So offer is going to present some data, um, about the book direct movement, how many bookings are coming from direct in our industry? What are some trends that we're seeing? And then we're going to go into some strategies that you can implement, hopefully right after this call, strategies that you can implement, uh, to start focusing on direct bookings. If you're not focused on it yet, uh, or uh, continue to improve uh, your marketing and uh, everything that has to do with uh, with our booking. So, Afar, you wanna you wanna kick it off with uh, and show us some uh, some numbers, some stats of uh, what's happening in Book Direct in 2024. Yeah, of course. You know, I think it's just important to remember uh, when it comes to Book Direct trends. Uh, Book Direct was all there was before there were OTAs, right? So when people were doing vacation rentals in the 70s and 80s, uh, Book Direct was all there was. Operators were sending out brochures, direct mail, having phone conversations with guests who came year after year. Um, so what that means is that from the data that we've seen from different sources, uh, Book Direct has been in a continual decline as a percentage of all bookings uh, since about last year. And last year's where we really see it bottomed out at around like 17 or 18 percent of all direct bookings. And some data came in this year that uh, Book Direct has rebounded for the first time. Uh, so hopefully we hit the bottom of the Book Direct journey and know we're starting to build back up after the OTAs kind of came and stole the whole market. So just in this is for just North America uh, last year for you know, an average operator, Airbnb was 46% of their business, Direct was 19%, which actually was up a few percentage and surpassed Verbo, which is at, at 17%. Booking was eight, Expedia two, and then Marriott Homes and Villa 1%, Homes to Go 1%, TripAdvisor 1%, and then other four. So, you know, I think it's some interesting trends that after many years of decline, uh, you know, all the efforts we've been making, obviously short-term rental operators, uh, all over the world have been making is that book directors maybe turn the corner and on the upswing after many, many years of decline. Um, yeah. So I guess that that's the first piece of data that, you know, we found that was uh, super interesting. And the other data point that I found interesting this year that I think relates to um, book direct is that when uh, people asked operators where they want to focus on in 2023 and 2024, after many years where it was very adding inventory, inventory was the key to growth. Uh, occupancy, increasing occupancy actually took the first place uh, this time. And I think that's really has to do with what Jasper mentioned in terms of competition on OTAs heating up. 
Uh, you're not getting the same demand gen that you used to through just relying on Airbnb and Verbo. Uh, so people are looking to other ways where they can source demand and that actually keeping occupancy high has become more important to the overall revenue picture than just adding incremental properties where you've kind of made this assumption that they're just going to be uh, fully be booked through existing demand channels. Awesome, man. Thank you. So, so definitely some uh, some interesting data. So it looks like we're, uh, we're the the movement is is definitely growing in two thousand twenty four. Um, Mark, do you have anything to to add to this? And what what are you seeing in in the industry right now? I think it was interesting what I was just mentioned about where everybody has been focused on getting more properties. Obviously, because you know two thousand twenty one, two thousand twenty two, it was booming. You know, and people are just like they couldn't keep up with the, the with the demand. You know, guests are literally just coming out the woodwork because of restrictions, et cetera. But then this year, as things have started to open up, travel has become back to pretty much normal all over the world. Uh, it's interesting that the the most commonly thing that people are looking for is, hang on a second, how do I fill all these properties <laughs> now that I've gathered all of them? So um, there's always going to be tons of competition, right? There's always going to be, new people coming on and you know there's obviously regulation may slow that down people changing their opinion or their business model or just people just going now nah, this isn't for me i've had one too many guest questions i don't i'm not fancy this so um i can i can totally see why now more than ever direct is 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 back on the on the on people's like thinking and uh like with with free world you, you've gone down the exact route it's like branding first like you've 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 gone down the whole process you've done this and where people are talking about the brand name so it's, it's exciting i mean this is exciting to me to see i love seeing data and stats like that and and you know obviously with with direct overtaking verbo that's that's even more funnier especially booking um so uh so yeah it's good to see good to see thanks mark uh conrad anything to add but I think the one question that I would always ask people who maybe would make the argument that they're fine, you know, just leveraging the OTAs and that's where they want to get all their traffic from is exactly what Arthur was saying a few minutes ago. What do you do when it's not, you know, giving you enough demand? What do you do when it's not giving you enough bookings? I could be wrong, but I feel like the only lever that you can pull if you're in that situation is to lower rates. Well, if I'm not getting enough bookings on Airbnb, for example, if I lower my rates at some point, maybe I'll get enough people checking me out to, you know, book even, even at a lower rate. So I feel like you're Again, going back to that earlier commentary of like less control, direct gives you you know more control to do that. I do wonder though that the trend kind of popping back up, like you mentioned a minute ago, Jasper or Arthur, um, is it just because that a lot of new people to our space tried a platform for the first time and Airbnb maybe had the most brand awareness in their mind? So if new people came in during 2021, 20, 22, maybe they just biased towards Airbnb because they had heard about it or maybe a friend had experienced it. So people that are brand new to our industry on the guest side might have gone in that direction. And then I think the host market was there to support them. You know, a first time host was also probably listing their property exclusively or only on Airbnb. So there's kind of two maybe things happening at the same time, more demand and more supply, a lot of people going to Airbnb, that makes sense to me. So the fact that it's pulled back even slightly and then direct is going up um, to me is a sign just that people are now, maybe there's too much inventory on Airbnb in some markets, or maybe there's not enough quality inventory on on Airbnb in some markets, maybe that's a case that you could make there. Um, along with the fact that if people now are doing their own, you know, they see less demand, they have to try other channels, they have to try their things. They can't just do the easy thing, which might be putting it on a single OTA. And in most markets, Airbnb is probably the OTA that makes the most sense to put it on if you were in a single channel. So it's a good thing, but I think this data to me doesn't reflect what I see with like property managers. So I think that probably there's a mix of some of the information in here from like a single property host is always going to struggle to get a lot direct versus a property manager who probably has a little bit more brand that they can build. Or from my understanding of where your properties are, Jasper, it's like a collection of properties in a single location, a little bit easier to build branding and have a budget when you have a collection in a single location versus like a one-off property in Houston, Texas, you know, that doesn't have the same type of branding capability. So mm -hmm. those are just some of my thoughts on those trends. That's that's interesting yeah, I mean, that you that you mentioned. Um, sorry, Arthur. Just one follow up question on that. Uh, so you're saying that the what the people that you're working with, the property managers that you're working with, they typically have a much higher share of of direct bookings. Yeah, I mean, we have several clients that are still ninety percent direct bookings, and I've been that way for a long time. Arthur, you were joking a minute ago when you were saying like direct was the default a long time ago. I have a client who will joke really frequently that he's like, "I've been doing this since nineteen eighty six. I've been doing this longer than you've been alive," and it's very true because um, he has been doing this since nineteen eighty six. So when when you go and study these larger property managers in legacy leisure markets in the U.S., I, I narrow in with that specific de de uh, distinctions because that is a different type of inventory. I would argue than 
short-term rental, you know, uh, demand, which might be more urban and things like that. We we did a whole debate on that a while ago, so I don't want to like crack open that can of short-term rental versus vacation rental. We'll be here all night. We will not stop, but uh, it'll be 3 a.m. and Mark will still be here with us. But um, anyways, when you look at a leisure market, large property manager, you know, the data that I indicate is that the top companies in those markets are typically 50, 60, 70% direct because they've built this brand over a long period of time. And if you're new to the industry, uh, to be honest with you, I don't think you should feel bad if you're only a 15% direct and you've only been doing it for six months, eight months a year. It takes time to build, you know, all the, you know, brand awareness, loyalty, marketing, machine, everything, website for Mark, that sort of thing. It takes time to get all those things live. It's not going to happen overnight. So I don't think you should feel bad either if you're brand new and you don't have a lot of direct, as long as you're working towards getting, you know, I think more independence in your business. I think you're probably on the right path. Yeah, hundred percent. Definitely takes time to build it up. Uh, but it's very, it's very, once you've built up a solid stream of uh, repeat guests and people are booking direct, uh, it's it definitely, you'll get the fruits, you harvest the fruits in for the, for the rest of the existence of your business. Right. So a little bit of work on the front end, uh, but definitely worth it. Uh, offer. Yeah. I just going to say, I think what Conrad brings up is so important is that we see such a huge mentality difference between maybe we call them legacy operators in these traditional markets and even new entrants in those markets or people that are new or relatively new to short-term rentals as in they started in the last five or six years is many of them, maybe they're 80, 90% OTA based and they are not even aware that there are operators that are 90% direct and that this is even an objective that is feasible to achieve, right? Uh, and so I think there, uh, we still have a bit of that dichotomy of the, people that go to Verma that are very legacy oriented and maybe some of these newer style of operators where there's just not that knowledge transfer that uh, such level of independence is possible and achievable. And hopefully Conrad can share later some of the tips and tricks and strategies that are getting people, you know, to achieve such a high level of direct booking. Cause that's, you know, obviously an amazing, like 90 plus percent to achieve is, is pretty remarkable for any business in the space. 100%. That's impressive, 90% direct bookings. And there are some companies that don't are not listed on the OTAs, right? Like Getaway is an example. Mm -hmm. They are that's part of their marketing is like they're 100% direct, right? So you can't book a Getaway. And by the way, if you don't know Getaway, it's a off the grid uh type of uh short term rental experience that they offer. Uh it's pretty cool getaway.com. You can check it out. Um, but let's, uh, let's go into some strategies, right? What can we, what kind of strategies can we employ this year to really drive those direct bookings? I want to kick it off with you, Mark, um, for people that are kind of new to direct bookings, like what, what are the basics that everyone should, uh, focus on when in, before investing in, in a book direct channel? Yeah. So again, we're going to do the assumption here that you've got your first property, whether it is owned or you're doing the, the rent to rent or arbitrage or, or whatever you're doing and you've realized that this is something that you really want to do so let's just say you've you've had at least six nine months under your belt you've uh you've had the joys of uh talking to guests and you know you've been giving out wi-fi codes at 11 o'clock at night and all that good stuff right and let's just assume now you're this is it this this is what you think because there's a lot of people who come into this industry are just testing the waters it's just like you know because there's low barrier to entry in this industry right um, obviously that will change with regulations, et cetera, but it's a very low barrier to entry. It's like a step above MLM, <laughs> right? What I joke about, but anywho. Uh, so with that being said, there's a lot of people that are just want to give it a go. It's maybe like the third or fourth thing that's generated income, but there will come a point in time when you go from property one to property two, say, or you go, you know what, this is for me. And that is the point where you need to start really properly thinking about how you run your business, because what, Airbnb want you to do is that they, they just want you to put everything on that channel, on that extra net. They want for you to go, right, if you're going to have property number two on there, property number three, they, they want you to then go, right, if you're going to connect on something like Verbo or set up a Verbo account, you're going to connect your Airbnb iCal to Verbo so you don't get uh, a direct booking. That's all their branding and all their marketing, which is phenomenal. They do it really well. But this is the most important part now because if you do that, you are building everything on the Airbnb land, which is what we we all talk about not to do. So I feel the starting point, the basics of all of this is that you've got to go and get yourself a property management software provider um, or PMP as, as hosts uh, call it. 
Um, there are loads out there, you know, unfortunately there's like, I think there's over a thousand <laughs> different property management software solutions. So you are going to have to do a little bit of research. There's not one that is better than any of them, because again, you can go into any Facebook group and you can ask the question, uh, who's the best PMS and you know, 10 people are answer, and you'll have 10 different uh, software solutions that are thrown at you. You really do have to find the one that that's right for you because some different PMSs are, are better than others, depending on, on your management, your business model, um, et cetera, et cetera. We did do a blog at Boostly. We, we interviewed hundreds of people and we put together a real cool blog post. If you want to go check that out, it's just Boostly, B-O-O-S-T-L-Y.co.uk forward slash PMS. Go do go check that out. Well, that I would say is, is, the, is the first thing that you should be doing is getting yourself a, a PMS because when you do have that, that is your central hub. That is your the place that you're going to go every day. That is the place that you connect to Airbnb, connect to Verbo, connect to Booking, connect to all these different channels. But it's also a place that you can then set up Stripe, for example, or payment gateways, and you can get yourself one of these cool little direct booking websites if you choose to have so with the with the PMS. And that is a great sort of central kicking kicking off point to to get started. Hmm. Yeah, the PMSs have definitely made it easy for us. Uh, I think the major ones, the Hostly, the Hostaway, the Guesty, and the, you know, there's, like you mentioned, there's thousands of them. Uh, they all have like a, a very basic but functioning direct booking website. And that's a question that we get a lot from people who want to start accepting direct bookings is, is like, oh, do I now need to spend like ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 on a direct booking website? Um, no, we can, you can use the PMS. I think eventually if you're really focused on scale and brand building, you want to have your own, uh, custom website. Uh, but the PMS website is perfect to, to start off with. Um, Conrad, any, anything to add to this? No, no, I think Mark lays it out well. And, and to your point, sometimes these template websites, they don't have all the customizations that you want. Maybe it doesn't have this look and feel that you want and things like that. You will outgrow it and that's okay. Like, I think that's the back half of that sentence. Like that's perfectly fine that you're not going to be with something forever, but having a solid system in place, we started working with someone not too long ago who's using a template site from owner res and she was doing already like 10, 15% direct. She was doing 10, $15,000 a month off of her direct booking website. Granted, Airbnb was still the bulk of her business, but I mean, this was quote unquote the free, or maybe it's like $10 a month template website that comes with owner res and she was still doing pretty well with it. Um, she's since got a custom site and she's doing better, but you know, I don't think that it's a requirement. Um, and the, I actually wrote a book as well. I should have mentioned that in my intro. I forgot about it. Um, called mastering vacational marketing. And in that book, um, we talk about the fact that there's layers to kind of what you're focusing on. And that first layer that Mark's talking about is kind of what we call that featherweight stage. So it's kind of like a boxing analogy and you got this featherweight stage. And I think getting the PMS is like one of the first things we put in that strategy sec section. And I think there is times and places where people try to skip ahead. They go and open social media pages and try to do marketing. Then they're pushing everybody back to their Airbnb listing when they should be pushing them back to their website. So they go a little out of order. Like, I don't think that's uncommon in our industry that people do things from what I consider to be like higher levels of marketing and they just forgot to go back and do the basics. So no, I think Mark described it well. And that is like step one. If I was advising a friend or family member and it was step one, step one would be PMS for sure. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll talk about the book for you. It's here, Conrad. There you go. Thank you. I appreciate that. You did a better oh, job having it ready than I did. So I, I knew I, I, I've got them all behind me. Oh, hey, thank you. Thank well, you. Let's show mine too, Mark. Where's mine? Where's mine? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, all right. So, offer outside of uh, signing up for StayFi, like what's the number one thing that uh, people should focus on when the, when before investing in their bar, the book direct channel? Yeah, for me, it's all about relationship building with guests, especially at the what Conrad calls that featherweight stage um you know how many touch points are you establishing prior to stay through automated messaging through a pms whether you use hospitable logify owner res hostfully there's a very good set of them that focus on this kind of owner operator or one to ten listing property manager or maybe a little more um because i think at every touch point prior to their arrival you can start the differentiation from airbnb and that ura X brand, right? Um, and, you know, guests assume you are an Airbnb, most of them, if they booked you there, and they will probably call you that. Um, so it's going to take multiple impressions to start driving that point of differentiation. Um, so I think communicating as yourself and connecting yourself to the brand, especially at the smaller stage, is really important. Like, we're this couple, I see that a lot, and we operate this company, it's called XYZ. Uh, thanks for staying with us, whatever. Here are the instructions to get in, all that kind of good stuff that you're doing through automated messaging. Obviously, introducing some branded elements in the property can be helpful. 
uh, what advice or help are you giving the guests that go above and beyond the just a place to sleep, whether that's simply like, here are our favorite activities, any value, these things can be very low cost, uh, just again, to build a personal relationship, especially at a smaller stage, because you don't even need a website at that stage to take a direct booking because people may just email you back uh, one-on-one -on -one and let you know that they want to return or they want to refer somebody else. And you can always, you know, hopefully manually process that booking as well in your PMS. So to me, like first stage is always relationship building before you even have to add technology, right? Uh, kind of the old fashioned way. And that can go really far to making sure people uh, want to come to you to do that next day and not to a platform. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good points. Uh, one thing I would add also is uh, the safety and security side, uh, right? If you start taking direct bookings, you have to think about how, uh, do, how do I do my guest due diligence, right? If somebody books for the OTA, you have some information when they book direct, you really don't know anything about them. So there's a lot of tools that you can use. We use Autohost, uh, but there's Superhawk and few other companies that you can use to protect yourself. You can charge a security deposit. Uh, sure, you can even insure every single stay. Uh, I think Superhawk off offers that service where you just pay a small dollar amount. And then if there's any damages, you can uh, you can then claim that um, with uh, with Superhawk. So there's a couple of things to uh, keep in mind. After you mentioned the payment processor, uh, we use Stripe for that. Very easy. It's integrated with pretty much all the PMSs. Uh, very easy to use as, as well. Um, one question that comes up a lot when we talk about direct bookings, especially uh, when we talk to operators who are not currently doing direct bookings, um, they associate book direct with building a brand. And we've touched on it. It's very important to build a brand. And if you are building a brand, then direct booking should definitely be a focused. But you even if you're not focused on building a brand, you just have you're just hosting as yourself and you don't have a company name, even then direct bookings could be a very beneficial avenue for you to focus on. Um, Mark, why don't you uh why don't you comment on that? Like do you do we need to have a brand in order to 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 focus on direct bookings? I I think the sooner you can do it, the better. I'm a big fan of number one, having your business name, your brand name, and you talk about it. Um we can definitely talk about that later, but I also think as well, you need to be giving your properties some form of brand name. It's something that is recognizable and, and rememberable. Um, as a, there's a real good example of, uh, somebody, uh, a guy called Rob Abasolo is, he's just created a property, uh, in uh, Texas. It's called the pink pickle, pink pickle house. And it's a bachelor house. It's all done pink. It's very Instagrammable. It's awesome, but I can remember the name, right. And it's very Googleable. So he's created a, a, a property, uh, like a, literally a property name that is Googleable and Instagrammable. So people will want to go and find it. And again, if you match that with great guest experience, then when your that person goes home, so that, those bachelorettes go back uh, and they say, oh, did you have a good time in in, uh, in, uh, in Texas? Did you have a good time in Austin? I go, yeah, absolutely amazing. Stayed at this place called the Pink Pickle. It was crazy. There was pink dinosaurs. There was a pickleball court in the back. It was unreal then that's them talking about it. And they've given the the name, the brand name, instead of them going back to friend's house or whatever and going, yeah, I said it's Airbnb. It was, it was unreal. Like they've, they've branded it, right? And I think the sooner you can do that, the better. And, you know, the hardest way to do it is if you're 40 properties deep and you just start the process, because then you've got to go back and do it all over again. So the sooner you can do it, uh, the, the better, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, actually, you think that? No, no, a lot of things to add there. Um, I, I think Mark nailed it with that example because it it's just a fun name and that always helps. I think that equation. Uh, we just did an episode actually on the podcast that I do about naming your company, and it's really hard, by the way, to name a company to find an open and available dot com domain name to find something that's not taken to find something that you know doesn't have trademark conflicts. Like it's really challenging, but it's worth it because at the end of the day, once you start that brand building process, you're now like so much further along, you know, in getting some of those initial direct bookings. One of the healthiest like signs that we see in a company too when we start to work with them is if we go into Google search console and we look at the property pages and we see people looking for the names of each property page and they're coming in many cases off Airbnb and they're looking or Verbo and they're looking for that property manager direct because maybe they want to save a little bit of that fee. Although I don't think that's actually the primary, the only motivation that the guest has. Maybe we could circle back to that. Everyone seems to make the 
uh, marketing positioning a book direct as saving money. I think that's maybe one part of it, but only a small part of it. But anyways, back to what Mark's example there, phenomenal example, because if that person, that host or, or owner has the available .com domain name, they have the Instagram handle and so on and so forth, they may still have an Airbnb profile and that's awesome. That's going to help them get more visibility. Why not leverage that channel? That's where people are going to look for properties. It'd be silly not to in my mind, but having uh, you know something that's memorable and things like that is so important. And I, I'm agree with Mark 100% there that some people wait too long to do it or they they cheap out and they, they go through this process quickly. Oh, let me just find an, a cheap you know name that I can get for 10 bucks. Well, the domain you may want, maybe $5,000 and that's okay too. Like it, you're investing into something that's going to last for a very long time if you do it well. So yeah, I'm, I'm very bullish on that idea. And in fact, it's something we talk about a little bit in the book that your initial direct bookings are not people searching for generic terms like best bachelorette party in Texas or you know that type of thing, right? It's people just looking for the name of your property, just building that own little thing that people search for you specifically is such a phenomenal way to get started. And that's probably how you're going to get your first five or 10 direct bookings. That's through exactly what Mark described there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, one thing to add to that is the .com names are often taken, um, but you don't necessarily need a .com, right? Um, we have a client, uh, Sergio, he is at junglehouse.org. I'm sure, Mark, you're familiar with him as well. Uh, so an org can work as well, right? Or there's like hundreds of them, right? So uh, if the .com is like 10 grand, then you might want to opt for a different uh, different extension there. We, we, we covered that. We covered that, Jasper, real quick. Here's my here's my counterpoint to that, which is that would you want a well-funded competitor to go and get your .com if you don't get it? So if you launch on a different TLD and then someone else who comes up with an idea and builds a business on your .com, would you want to compete with that forever? That, that would kind of be the question to ask. So yeah. I'll push against you a little bit on that one because it, <laughs> it can be a big expense. And that is why, honestly, like we've gotten really far with clients on coming up with a brand name and then we can't get the .com. It's taken, it's in use by someone else. And even though we all like the name, we throw it in the trash because we say it's not going to end up being the viable path for us long-term. So I, there are other cheaper options out there, but I would argue they're cheaper for a reason. And I would say that that investment of having that domain name is something that, what's the what's the expression? Like the pain of the high price will you know sting you once, but mm -hmm. long-term you're really going to enjoy it, that sort of thing. The cheap domain name will probably end up costing you a lot of bookings in my experience long-term because people go to the wrong TLD and things like that. Yeah, and I guess that's especially important if you're really looking to scale your, your business as well, right? And if you have a name that's like not super unique, um, offer anything to add to this? Yeah, I mean, I think it all just goes back to like, what are your aspirations and what are your goals as a short-term rental operator, right? Um, you know, if you only want to do this on the side or you only want to manage one or two properties, maybe you don't need a brand and you can, you know, transact with people through Google and the OTAs are going to provide, I'm not through email and the OTAs are going to provide the rest, right? But uh, I think anyone who's, you know, aspiring to uh, be a professional operator that's either growing their own portfolio or growing a property management business, brand is key. And then brand also, maybe we can touch upon this earlier, but brand's also very important for homeowner acquisition. Uh, so if you property management is the way that you're going it's it's serving two sides of the market not just one yeah that's a good point for sure um let's see we have about 25 minutes left there's a couple other topics that we want to dive into number one is email marketing and data collection obviously like collecting the email addresses from our guests is a big part of uh, really optimizing your direct booking channels. Arthur, I know you're the expert on collecting emails. Uh, so why don't you kick it off? Um, you know, what's the, what are some, some ways to collect emails from our guests and how do we really maximize, uh, having a database of, uh, of emails? Yeah. I mean, that's really the thesis behind like why I started stay Fi is that particularly, particularly in this industry, uh, the best place to fish for direct bookings are going to be your, uh, existing guests that have stayed with you and loved you because there's both the trust factor that's inherent when somebody's like stayed and loved the experience before. Also, if you're not a large and established brand, or maybe you just have the PMS website, it may not get the trust from a net new booker uh, that, you know, a hotel could more easily engender or something like that for somebody just stumbling on the website. Right. Uh, so in this industry, I think there's like a few unique characteristics where repeat guests uh, is the first place, you know, I would look to when it comes to driving direct bookings because they trust you, love you, they want to come back and they know who you are, right? Um, so from a collection standpoint, obviously at StayFi, uh, we have a solution to collect data from everybody, not just the booker through the Wi-Fi. Uh, but there are other great ways to collect data. Uh, you may have some in your PMS already. You may retrieve 
require a rental contract, for instance, where you are collecting the email and getting the, the guest to opt in, at least from the booker. There are digital guidebooks may help you collect some emails during the course of the stay. Of course, you can always ask guests for their emails in any other communication you have in a way that's like compliant with uh, Airbnb and Verbo, depending on how you're communicating, right? Um, and then, of course, your website is another great place to collect data. So there's lots of potential sources. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I love ours the most just because it, it captures everybody in a seamless way. Uh, but for us, especially starting out, you know, we see customers with 10, 20, 30 percent of their bookings over the course of years coming from repeat guests. Uh, and it's, I think, the easiest place to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, it's really interesting because any business owner knows that your hottest leads are your customers, your actual customers, the people who've already bought from you. It's easier to get somebody who's already bought from you to buy from you again than to find a new person to buy from you. Right. But this is an aspect that's widely overlooked in our industry because we've got so spoiled by platforms like Airbnb who just have been giving us so many bookings in, in especially a few years ago now, you know, starting to change. Um, but you know, people have a lot of operators just have not utilized this really important mar marketing channel of actually getting your, your cu current customers to come back. Right. So, uh, we just started, uh, using Stayfy actually. So we're, we're excited. The main reason that we're uh, onboarding is because uh, we really want to collect as many email addresses as possible. So if we host eight people, we want eight email addresses, right? Because then we can market to eight people versus just a booker. Um, so I think it's uh, I'm super excited to to start using your tool, Conrad. Um, I want to ask you about because there's two really two ways that we can build up our direct bookings. Offer just spoke about the first way, which is very simple. We collect the email from the guest. And then we start emailing them and trying to get them to come back, right? That requires very little investment. Um, thanks to Offer, this is super easy to do and to set up. But then there's another way of driving direct bookings where we're actually going to try and source the guest. So before the guest goes to Airbnb or another OTA and finds us, we're going to actually try and get the guest to come to us in the first place. Uh, and the most powerful strategy to do that is called SEO, search uh, engine optimization. I know you're the expert on that. So um, yeah, is that is that something that, because that requires a little bit of investment, right? To build up that, uh, uh, to source that guest. Is that something that you recommend people start off with or at what stage in our business should we start focusing on that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of restate a little bit of what I stated earlier, but in the context of getting organic search traffic, your early SEO wins, again, are not going to be ranking for Orlando, Florida vacation rentals, especially if you only have one. That's just, that that is not the game that you're playing when you're starting out and you have your initial direct booking website. Your goal at first with SEO is just when people search me on Google, can they at least find that brand name? So the pickle house example from Mark a few minutes back, that, that host or manager, I don't know, may not actually rank right now when you do that search. It's actually very plausible that his Airbnb listing might rank better in Google search organically. Um, it's plausible that he might have a listing on Verbo or other uh, OTA sites like we were talking about earlier with Arthur. So his first SEO goal was not, I'm going to go out here and try to rank for all these generic search terms that are very competitive. It's actually just to rank for the brand name. And it sounds simple, but you'd be surprised that sometimes people just fail that simple test, even when they're getting started. So putting together the property detail page in a logical way, having the basic on-page SEO work done. Um, on, on our site, we have a, a guide to SEO that really buckets everything into four buckets. There's technical SEO, which is how Google actually processes the page itself, the underlying HTML, that sort of thing. There's link building. Has anyone actually referenced your website? When you have a brand new website, unfortunately, no one really knows about it. And when I say no one, I mean Google doesn't really know about the website. So you've got to get some of those initial links, at least even when you have one property, we've got to get something going so the website gets indexed and someone actually cares about it, like people actually might have the chance to visit it. There's content creation. What, what actually information are we putting on the website? In this scenario, it might be what uh, information am I putting on the property detail page? So the property description, uh, my headings, my information, the name of the property should be the H1, things like that. And then finally, keyword research, which could be a, a deep well for us to dive into. But largely speaking, again, at first, it's all about optimizing for the obvious keywords, like your brand name and the name of your individual listings. Then as you get that done, you can kind of move up the ladder, so to speak. That's what we talk about a little bit in the book as well. Um, getting into like, 
more longer tail keywords. So maybe you want to start a blog and start to create content. But in my mind, it's all about starting at that first step, which is the brand layer, and then going up the difficulty ladder as you kind of see some successes. Again, I think the mistake that a lot of people make is they start out and they have one listing and they go, I want to go ring for Orlando, Florida vacation rentals, which is a keyword that might have, you know, 50, 100, 200 other global sites and local sites competing for it. And you're just going to be very far down that ladder. There's a time and a place. And if you go look at most of these leisure markets, you will find, you know, local property managers who rank well in Google organically for these valuable keywords. We just started working with a client in Key West who's already ranking like number two or number three for Key West vacation rentals. He outranks mm -hmm. Airbnb. He outranks Verbo and things like that. He's also you know, had the website active for over a decade. So he's had some built-in advantages towards those four areas I was talking about earlier. He's in good technical shape. He's got a lot of links pointing to the website. He's got content built out and so on and so forth. So I think with both things that we just talked about over the last few minutes, the example I would give to um, email collection with Arthur is like probably the best, what's the expression, the best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago and the next best time is today. People wait too long to sign up for StayFi and what Arthur is offering. And they say, oh, I'll get emails later on. And then they miss out on these hundreds of guests that they could have been marketing to this whole time, which I, I get it. It's, it's, it's challenging for that, you know, person to realize that they're spending a lot of time and not getting a lot of benefit out of it, you know, added at first. And when you have an email list of 40 people, let's be honest, you may not see a huge lift, but a year from now, you're going to have a list of 400 people, depending on the size of your company, you could have a list of 4,000 people, you know, a year after that. So mm -hmm. you're going to grow. It's going to take time. And I think starting these things early on is understanding what level of difficulty you should be accomplishing and not getting way out ahead of yourself and thinking you need to rank for something very competitive. There's a time and place for that. You might reach that, but start with the brand name on the SEO side mm -hmm. and then go from there. That would be my advice. Yeah, can I, ask, can I ask a question to Conrad? I just have one follow up nope, there. No, not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm just curious from your clients. Obviously, ranking for the property name is super important. Like, how mm -hmm. what is realistic around that kind of billboard effect where your names are all aligned on platforms? Kind of, what do you see in terms of success in terms of people just discovering your property that way, and then and then finding you on your own website? Yeah, you, you can see some of this data pretty easily in Google Search Console. We have clients who the, like are established property managers. They've been around a long time, and they'll obviously regularly launch new listings. So they'll name that listing, they'll brand that listing, and it's not uncommon for us uncommon for us to see a client launch a listing, and we start to see a little uptick right away. Like within three to five days after launching that property on Airbnb, we'll start to see people searching for like the name of that listing, usually plus the area. So it might be like you know, Bears Den, you know, Blue Ridge, Georgia, or something like that. So they'll do that kind of search in Google. Um, as far as numbers go, I don't have any in front of me, but just like my anecdotal kind of feelings that I've had over the years and like data that I can just synthesize and see in my head. Some property detail pages might only get a handful of clicks a month. Five or 10 is not necessarily uncommon, or I don't think you should be necessarily disappointed if you only get 10 or 15 people a month searching the exact name of that listing. Again, that's so bottom funnel traffic that I still think you might get a booking or two out of even 15 visits because it's so specific. Now, we have clients that we've worked with, um, including a large property manager in California who manages um, kind of like a viral Airbnb type property, and that property gets literally thousands of visits a month. So that's an extreme example, but it, it, it can range a lot depending on how notable the property is, how many people are looking for it. It could be a dozen, it could be 12,000, right? Depending on the property itself. And any advice on the naming of properties and doing some research to make sure you have a unique name that's not taken? Because I I know I work yeah. with some of these companies in the Smoky Mountains and it's like Bears Den, Black Bear right. Den 3. It's just like a lot of, uh, you know, very similar types of names I could imagine would make that search discovery challenging. Yeah, the, the book that we highlighted actually in the recent podcast ep episode we did is, is called Hello, My Name is Awesome. That book is by an author called Alexander Watkins. So I love that book. I think it's a great process for naming. It's tedious. It's slow. It's going to take you a long time to figure out the name. And if you have a large portfolio and you're a property manager and you have the name 500 homes, um, it's it's very challenging. So I, I don't know if I have a great answer. I will say we haven't said AI so far, which is interesting. 45 minutes in, we haven't mentioned AI. But I think that AI is actually, ChatGPT in particular, is actually really good at naming vacation rental properties when you prompt it correctly. Like if you give it a lot of attributes, hey, I'm trying to name a vacation home in this market and so on and so forth, but then you're still going to have to rely on good old, Go good old Google. You may find a name that's decent to your point, Arthur, but then you have to go out and search in Google and make sure no one else is using that name. This pickle, this pickle uh, property that <laughs> Mark was mentioning earlier, let's say I brainstormed that name and I just came up with it. I did that search and I found that someone else was using it. Well, now I've got to throw it out and start over. So it's tedious. I don't know if I have a hacker work around there, but I will say ChatGPT can be a pretty good brainstormer to assist you with that process in my experience. I want to touch on one thing you said, uh, Conrad, and that's the importance of building that email list. Uh, I have a friend who sold uh, an e-commerce company for millions and millions of dollars. Uh, and I, I asked him for one piece of advice uh, for my business. And what should I, one number one main thing I should focus on, he's like your email list, because 
people can take away things from you. Like Airbnb can close your account to your point. Somebody can trademark your, your brand name. And there was a question about that that we'll touch on uh, in, in a few minutes here too. But your email list, that's your that's your number one asset that you own and that nobody can take it from you, right? Uh, and you can have that, you can utilize that email list for the rest of uh, the rest of your life, essentially, right? Um, so totally agree. The, the earlier you start, the better. In the beginning, you might not see crazy results, but uh, you're gonna thank yourself a couple of years from now, right? Um, yeah. Mark, I want to. And- um, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you're good. Go ahead. Go ahead. We're good. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I was gonna go to Mark because he's like, you know. I think he he wants to he wants to talk. He's wiggling his head. I know it's late in the UK, so I want to make sure he doesn't fall asleep. Um, so we touched on the email collection side. We touched on SEO. Um, next next up is the website itself, right? We mentioned that most PMSs have a very basic website that you can use to start accepting direct bookings. But at some point, if you really want to build your brand, like you you want to move away from that uh, and really have a customized uh, website for for your brand, right? So Mark, at which point do you think people should upgrade from that PMS website to a custom built website? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question because we get, we get a lot of people book a call with us at Boostly and um, one of the first things that we want to gauge is where they are in in their business journey and i think one of the best things that we've asked we've gone down loads of different routes how many properties do you have how many years you've been in business how many staff members but it truly comes down to revenue like where are you in your revenue journey and i would say once you get past that first six figures in uh in in revenue i feel like not profit revenue i think mean, that is when you are you, you are ready because i think up until that point there are tons of free advice that is out there now that can help you put together or just help you generate bookings. Right. And the, the free PMS website will get you to a certain point. Right. And, and, and we've, we've mentioned it all the, the pros and cons of it. I feel once you've got past that first six figures, I think that's when you've got the budget to be able to, to do it because I'm not talking about getting a website. I'm not saying go to Fiverr and find someone that'll do it for $200 or speak to your mate down the pub who's got like a, a dodgy uncle who does websites on the side. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a professional who knows this industry inside out, but has got a framework that is guaranteed to work. That is when you go to, to, to that to that next level. But what's, what's also important as well is when you go to get a, a, a website, anybody like can literally put together a website for you is what you do with it is how you get that traffic to it. Like Conrad like one of the best talking about SEO and every time he talks about it, I, I learned like new things and the book was like phenomenal for that as well. But it's not just like SEO. You've got to think about social media. You've got to start thinking about all those things that you are going to do that is going to actually get eyeballs on, on that site. So uh, like I say, we, we've, we've spent eight years figuring out what's that barometer. And it literally, unfortunately just comes down to revenue. And I would say once you've got past that first six figures of annual revenue, I think that's when you're ready. Awesome. Anything, uh, anything to add to that guys? No, no, I think that's a good level in the, in the bookmark, as you know, we, we defined it as 250,000 in gross booking revenue is like a pretty interesting layer to start considering. So I think when you're within that, especially if you're looking to grow and everyone's every once in a while, I'm sure you've seen outliers too, Mark, people who make the investment early on knowing that there's no ROI in month one or month two or month three or month four, right? Like, but they're making the investment because they're hoping to build the company into something a lot bigger. And we dealt with someone like that recently. Um, that's why I think the number of properties thing is, is appropriate, Mark, because we have a client that we worked with a while ago who was, um, Two, two properties, we're still working with them today, does 1.2 million in gross revenue off of two properties. Now, that's not common, right? Very high end, very luxury listings. But if you said to someone, well, you know, reach out when you have five listings, PMS companies actually say that, you know, reach out, use our PMS when you have five listings, they would have missed out on a phenomenal customer. So there, there's always outliers. There's always the person too that has 20 listings and they, they're they very, you know, low revenue, small listings, they don't make a lot of money. So I think the revenue numbers probably make a little bit more sense. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to Mark's point, where are you trying to go? You know, if you're trying to stay where you're at, maybe you can be a little bit more conservative and if you're trying to build this awesome company, you need an awesome, you know, business website because that, that's ultimately how your business is going to be reflected online through your website. So. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And thank you for sharing that. Uh, okay. We have about 10 minutes left. Uh, left. There are some questions in the Q and a let's, uh, let's go through that. Some we might be able to answer in the, the actual, uh, in the, in the Q and a chat. Um, <clears throat> but let me, let me take a look. The first question 
uh, is uh, asked by Anonymous. I don't, know, I don't know who it is, but he say he or she is saying, I end up paying the same fees in uh, to Book Direct due to credit card fees as I do for, uh, on the OTA, uh, which is about three percent. Um, I'm assuming you're referring to the three percent credit card fee and then the three percent fee that we that we uh, are being charged on Airbnb if we if the guest pays the you know the the bigger fee of of twelve to twenty percent. I think it is. Um, so what's the benefit if, if we pay 3% in credit card processing fees and we pay 3% on an Airbnb booking, like where do we benefit? It was well, I think, oh uh, yeah, my, my logic here really quickly on that was why is someone paying a higher fee on Airbnb? Cause the Airbnb is charging that guest fee. It sounds like obviously this person has their business set up where they're just paying that fee. They're not taking in the whole fee, which I know is now an increasingly common requirement for Airbnb that you pay that fee. And the guest fee is, is zero. I mean, it's not zero. We all know it gets absorbed into the host. So my question would be, why are they doing their pricing the way they're doing their pricing? Um, my, my take on it would be, they should be setting up their pricing so that a book direct booking is in fact more profitable because there's obviously some spread there. Airbnb is using it to charge their service fee. You can charge a fee. Maybe it's not the same one. You know, we tell clients, maybe if the Airbnb fee is 12%, maybe yours is seven and a half or 8%. But in my mind, a, a direct booking should be more profitable, not less. So it sounds like they just haven't set up their fees in a way that I would typically recommend or I find most optimal. Um, and actually people in this situation really quickly, the last thing I'll say on that is that they actually find themselves really challenged to make marketing investments because they don't actually bring in more revenue as they get more direct bookings. So they kind of find themselves in a weird way, like starve, like they're doing more direct bookings, but it's not leading to actually more revenue that they can use to build out their marketing kind of systems or make advertising investments or build a website with Mark or whatever the case may be. So I think they've actually set up their business and their fee structure incorrectly. And I think that's the first thing they should work on first. Um, then they can absorb the you know cost of doing insurance or other things there. The last thing I'll say, just anecdotally, this is not my world, so I don't want to comment on it. If you're trusting the Airbnb insurance to cover you if something actually goes wrong, you may be okay some of the time, and sometimes you'll get caught incredibly exposed. And I've seen some really sad, bad things happen by assuming that Airbnb will get you and cover you if something actually does go wrong. So I just want to give a different yeah. aspect of this. Sorry, just very, very quickly. Um, is that when, if you're going to think down this route, oh, you know, I'll, I'll do an OTA booking, but a direct booking, I end up like paying or losing out money or it's, it works out the same. The main thing that I want to talk about is control, right? When a booking comes in, on Airbnb, you've always got that big brother that is overlooking you for the whole of the booking process and guests know this, right? So let's just say for whatever reason, you have to cancel that booking, right? If it's a an Airbnb booking, they make you feel like the scum of the earth. If you have to cancel that booking as a host, they say, listen, we're going to get rid of that super host badge that you love very much. Those rankings, <laughs> kiss goodbye to them. You know, you feel like yeah, you feel like the worst of the worst to cancel that booking, but also as well, any communication that goes on during this day, they're always watching. So if it's a direct booking and for whatever reason you have to cancel that booking, guess what you do? Cancel done. <laughs> you know, sorry, we had to cancel this. And there's no, there's no worry of algorithms. There's no worry of uh, of all of that that goes on behind the scenes. It literally is a control part. So I totally understand when you try and like weigh it up from a financial point of view. But what I counteract that and say, it literally comes down to control. When you've got a direct booking, it's your business, it's your rules, it's your policies. There's nobody telling you what you've got to do with your business. Um, and and that, and that's what I always say to that. Yeah, one thing to add to that as well is there's two models on Airbnb, right? There's either you pay 15% as a host or the guest pays, I think it's somewhere between 12 and 20% based on the booking. Um, so in our case, we paid a 15% host fee. So if we book $100 on Airbnb, we receive 85, right? But if you pay the host, if the guest pays the host fee, and I don't think you can choose here, uh, it seems like Airbnb dictates what model you're you're in uh, based on your market and if you're using what PMS and whatnot. But if if the guest is paying the fee, then if you have $100 on Airbnb as your rate, the guest is going to pay 115 right? So you can then say, hey, book direct with me and charge 105 or 110 on your direct booking side. And so you're receiving a higher rate, but the guest is still paying less, right? So either way, you know, the, the point is like between you and the guest, 15% is saved, right? Where that savings go depends on your model and how you manage it. 
Uh, but the money is saved because no OTA is going to earn any money on, on a booking that goes through our direct booking website, right? So uh, hopefully that answers the question. Um, one really quick one. Uh, if you start a brand, do you want do you need to trademark it? Yes, absolutely. Especially if you're looking to scale that brand. Uh, somebody commented that they're in a in a battle now over a trademark. Uh, we actually have are somewhat in a similar spot as well. So highly recommend once you choose your brand name, go ahead and trademark it. Uh, you'll thank yourself later for that. Um, all right, let me see some other questions. Um uh, Tom is asking best recommendation to streamline and automate the extra admin work that comes with a direct bookings. Who, who wants to take that one? I feel like if the PMS is set up correctly, I, I guess I've just never thought as that as the um, limiting factor in getting more direct is like having more additional admin work. So I'll be honest, I've not heard that very commonly before The I've heard more about like the liability concerns or risk or things like that. Um, but yeah, that, that's a new one to me. I've, I don't know, Mark, if you have some more direct feedback on that, given that you work with a lot of hosts, is a direct booking more time consuming, assuming you have the right PMS infrastructure set up? Yeah, if you've got the right blueprint in place, if you've got the structure in place, then it's it's not, right? Um, but again, it's you got to get that. So I would go and pick up a copy of a book called The Book Direct Blueprint if you want to get that fine blueprint of uh, of of, uh, of what to do in place. But yeah, as long as you've got your systems and your stuff in place, then you're, you're good. Awesome. Thank you. I'm uh, just answering some questions in the Q and A here and guys feel free to take a look at the uh, Q and A, see if there's anything you want to answer. Cause I don't think we'll be able to answer all the questions live. Um, but let me see what's the most interesting question here. Uh, someone's asking, do you have any data on changing up each listing title versus giving each a static name? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we, we've had a lot of clients ask us about this in the past, where if you're, should each property have a name? Should that name stay the same forever? Should I use the limited Airbnb uh, title space that I have, 35 or so characters only show on the listing page now to talk about the brand of the property, the name of that property? Or should I talk more about the things that are not um, obvious? So I think the common technique or tactic you see nowadays is you mentioned things in the headline like pool, game room, and stuff like that, which doesn't leave you room to say the name of the property, the pickled property from earlier, for example. I don't know if I have a great answer there. I think you just have to test it. But, but if putting the name in the property lifts your overall searches and visits your website off platform, you may consider that a reasonable trade-off, but it may also hurt, to be fair, your performance on the OTAs, and you may need some of those bookings to run your business effectively. So we've had clients that have gone either way. Um, if you want to look at a large operator operator in our space that does that, Sonder brands their listings very heavily. If you go into any Sonder listing, you'll see Sonder is the first thing listed, then like a pipe or some kind of separator, and then a bunch of keywords after that. Um, and I feel like they're trying to both leverage Airbnb and build their brand so they can get more bookings to their properties. So I think that's the kind of thing you have to test. I also don't mind when we've done client work in the past, writing the descriptions, like the headlines and the descriptions for OTA things. Um, you know, if it's not working, don't feel, don't feel bad changing things on Airbnb in particular, changing a cover photo, changing the headline of a description can sometimes get you back shuffled up in the top of the list. And I think just like we talked about SEO earlier, Google has their own set of characteristics, technical link building, content SEO, that sort of thing. Airbnb, of course, has their own kind of SEO, if you will, right? Optimization within the search engine of Airbnb. And I think you might just have to try it. We have clients that have done that, that have put the name of their property in the listing and seen a nice off platform. Um, you know, boost from that, but there is some trade-off that I do admit is not optimal for everybody in every scenario. Gotcha. Uh, one more other quick question for you, Conrad, is uh, you mentioned you work with an operator who gets 90% of their bookings direct. The question mm -hmm. is, how does their occupancy rate look like? Yeah, it was actually a call I had today with someone who's in that bucket. Um, and to be clear, one thing I should always, I feel like I should preface this always, people, this this person has been in business since 2007, right? So he he is benefiting a ton from brand building work, advertising work, email list collection that he's been doing, um, you know, for quite a long time. So I feel, again, someone new may compare themselves and go, how is that possible? Well, you know, he has a, he a heck of a head start on someone who's brand new, even if they were in his same market. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, it's like high, high 70% right now, 79, mm -hmm. 70, 80%, that sort of thing. And he's still on the OTAs. You could still book him through the OTAs. What he does, though, is li uh, release limited inventory. So for example, he'll release like the next 45 days of availability on Airbnb. Anything past that, you can only book on his website. So it only releases last minute stuff on Airbnb, for example. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. Um Let's see, Mark, there's a couple of Boostly specific questions. Maybe you can answer those uh, in the Q&A. 
Um, and then let's do one more question and then we'll wrap it up uh, just to respect everybody's time here. Uh, Blake is asking about the terminology, right? We all know that Airbnb has managed to to basically like uh, change the, the 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 name, the terminology of short-term rental to an Airbnb, which is very impressive, by the way. There's not a lot of companies. Google is an example, like U-Haul, like this, you know, there's certain companies that have managed to uh, to do that. But the question here is, how do we win the terminology air war, quote unquote, to market book direct? SEO search trends show Google searches people are using Airbnb in the name of location versus using the standard terms like vacation rentals in location, short-term rental in location. Airbnb is trademarked using the term Airbnb in your Google AdWords campaign. Who wants to comment on that? Yeah, sorry. I feel like I'm the dominant in the Q&A, guys. I'm really, <laughs> this wasn't intentional, but uh, I got to answer my guy, Blake. So um, uh, if, if this is the Blake McKenzie, I think it is, then hi. Um, yeah, I, I guess my, my take there, Blake, is that it, you can't control that, right? Like we can't control how people search and the behavior of what people, the consumer does online. So I don't, well, all we can do is try to optimize and get the traffic that's out there for us to pick up. But I will say one thing that's really funny when you do run generic like Google ads and you bid on a keyword like vacation rentals in Victoria, British Columbia, for example, which is I suspect where uh, he might be referencing, um, Google will frequently show your ads when people search for Airbnb if you allow phrase match or broad match keywords. So it's not that you can't, you could not use Airbnb in the copy, the headlines, et cetera, of your ad, but you're not restricted from bidding on Airbnb keywords, to be clear. So if you wanted to bid on Airbnb keywords and you believe that is a generic term, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. In my experience, the conversion rate of that traffic tends to not work as well when they end up on a vacation rental manager's website as opposed to on Airbnb because they're searching for Airbnb, obviously. So yeah, my logic is it, it, it's not that I would never do that, but I would do that only after I maximized all the available traffic that I could get in Google ads on the keywords that I can bid on more easily. Again, vacation rentals, short-term rentals, and things like that. So as far as changing the terminology of the guest, I think it's one thing uh, that I think we should do is just correct the guest all the time. Oh, I booked an air. I booked an Airbnb with you. No, uh, no, no. That's not what you did. I think Mark does a good job of that, and all the stuff that I've seen him do. So, um, yeah. Can we stop it? No. Like we have limited influence, but in your little world, you have influence. Max out what you can get, and then if you want to dip your toe in that water, you can. Obviously, be respectful of the trademark. Don't put it in your copy, but you can't bid on that keyword and try to get traffic on that keyword in Google Ads specifically if you want to. Yep. Thank you for uh, answering that question. Um, all right, guys, we are uh, just over an hour. I want to respect everybody's time. So offer Conrad and Mark, thank you so much for, for being here today. This was awesome. Thanks, to everybody, for attending as well. Uh, before we uh, leave you all, I want to give everybody the chance to uh, let the attendees know where they can find you in case they have more questions. So offer when you, you want to take it, uh, kick it off. Yeah, for sure. Um, feel free to email me at arthur at stayfi.com if you have any questions. Uh, and if you're interested in Stayfi, you can, of course, go to stayfi.com, book a demo, learn more about our tool. And we have tons of resources to help folks be successful with email marketing. Uh, so definitely look forward to hearing from some of you. Awesome. Comrade? Yeah, I'm most active on LinkedIn personally. So if you want to connect with me in some social channel, that's the one where I probably do spend the most time myself. Um, otherwise, yeah, go to builduppbookings.com. Uh, you can also pick up a copy of the book. I uh, Thank you, Mark, for uh, having it ready physically. I didn't have it ready physically. Mastering Vacation Rental Marketing on Amazon.com. I think it's 15 bucks, and I think there's a lot more knowledge than that in there. So appreciate that. Right on. Mark? I just love the, how many times I've got Conrad to say pickle in uh, in one hour. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> reset record. If that was a drinking, if that was a drinking game, that would have gone really badly for a lot of listeners. I, I am drunk yeah. right now. So here we go. <laughs> uh, so my name is Mark Simpson. Uh, how can you get in contact with us? Uh, Instagram. I like Instagram uh, at Boostly UK. Or if you want to do something really funky, you can go and chat to my AI twin right now on uh, boostly.co.uk forward slash bot. Uh, you go check it out. You can ask it some cool questions. You can even call me and speak to me if you really want to hear these lovely Yorkshire accents. And I've got some bad news, Jasper. Liverpool have lost 3-0. Oh, no. Uh, Damn it. Oh, I'm gonna go that's, why, that's why he's been in a bad mood. <laughs> yeah, I've been fuming here. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, we'll, anyway. we'll get over it. Um, <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks. Thank you so thanks, much. Uh, this has been amazing. Thank you. Uh, if you want to... Uh, for everybody who's looking, if you if you want to learn more, get paid for your is uh, is my podcast. Welcome to check it out. Reach out and uh, answer and ask any questions you want. So thanks everybody. Enjoy the weekend, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye bye. -bye.